Hello everyone and welcome to the Biblical Bookworm. My name is Elizabeth and today I'll be talking about the book Searching for and Maintaining Peace, which was published in 2002 by Father Jacques Philippe. I chose to read and summarize this book because this book has been recommended to me many times by subscribers and also in the video I made a couple weeks ago where I asked other YouTubers for book recommendations. The author explains what peace of heart is, why it is necessary, how to acquire it, and then the author also explains what to do in situations where one might be tempted to lose that peace, like for example the troubles of life, our difficulty to believe in divine providence, the fear of suffering, the faults of others, and what to do after having sinned. Now, why should we try to acquire peace of heart? The author explains that in order for God's grace to work best in us, we have to make an effort to acquire peace. He compares this to a lake, as the sun reflects better in a lake that is calm, and so God can work better in a calm and peaceful soul. Another benefit of that peace of heart is that it helps us to free us of ourselves and make us more compassionate for our neighbor. The author explains that inner peace is not only a condition for the spiritual combat, but sometimes that's the spiritual combat itself. According to Father Philippe, the spiritual combat doesn't mean to never fall, as we all make mistakes and sin, but the goal is to not be discouraged or sad about our mistakes, and to remain peaceful even when defeated. Father Philippe writes that all reasons to lose inner peace are bad reasons, and especially losing inner peace because one has lost inner peace is a bad idea. He also clarifies that this book and the search for an inner peace is not an invitation to inaction or indifference, but an invitation to follow the spirit of peace. And then Father Philippe explains how we can acquire that peace of heart. And he says that we acquire inner peace by trusting God and accepting our own weakness. Here I'd like to read two Bible passages Father Philippe also quotes in the book. First we have John 14, 27, where it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And in John 16, 33, it says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Father Philippe also quotes St. Augustine, who said, Our hearts are restless till they rest in you. And the author writes that goodwill is both a necessary and a sufficient condition for peace. So if we have goodwill, that is enough for us to acquire inner peace. He defines goodwill as always trying to follow God's will. This goodwill can coexist with faults, as it's not about being perfect, but about trying to serve God as well as possible. And then he also quotes Matthew 6, 25, 34, where Jesus tells us to not worry and to trust him. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And he clarifies that God can let us lack money, etc., but he will never let us lack himself and his assistance. Father Jacques explains how to acquire that trust in God's providence and writes that we have to make room for God in order for him to work in us. And to make the reader better understand what he means, he compares this situation with using a parachute. In order for us to feel the parachute, we first have to jump. And as St. Francis de Sales said, the measure of divine providence in us depends on the degree of trust we have in it. 
Now, how do we make room for God's providence? The author advises us not to plan everything in fear that it will go wrong otherwise. Of course, there are situations and events that need preparation, but sometimes we can and should do things without exactly knowing what will happen and if it will work out. For example, he says that religious orders take care of sick and poor before they know what and how they are going to feed them, and that's when God works a miracle. We also have to remember that when we let God act freely in our lives, he will make us happier than we ever could have made ourselves. And he quotes St. John of the Cross, who said that all goods have been given to him after he stopped looking for them. Then the author addresses our misconception that we often feel like something in our lives should change so that we can make spiritual progress. So we're always making excuses why we're not making progress. Like, for example, we are not holy enough to pray, but that's not true, as what really has to change is our heart, so basically our attitude. When it comes to suffering, he quotes St. Therese of Lisieux, who said that God doesn't permit unnecessary suffering. And if you're interested to learn more about the reasons for suffering, you can watch my video on the problem of pain by C.S. Lewis. Father Jacques also talks about the situation where we see someone else suffer and he reminds us that God loves that person more than we do and, again, doesn't permit her to suffer without a reason. And sometimes the person who experiences the suffering or that experiences a trial accepts that and suffers it better than the people around that person. So we have to remember that sometimes the person that suffers can actually be at peace with that and accepts that, while the people who love that person worry much more about that person. Then he gives advice on how to bear the faults of others. He writes that if God hasn't freed a person of a certain fault, he is waiting patiently for the right moment, so we shouldn't want that fault to go away sooner than God. And he reminds us that even when we desire something good, like the conversion of a person, but we desire it in the wrong way, so for example, impatiently, we still can sin. That also applies to desiring our own sanctification. Here he quotes St. Francis Xavier, who said that nothing impedes the acquisition of a virtue as much as the obsessive wish to acquire it. After that, Father Jacques talks about how we should behave after having sinned. He advises the reader to repent, go to confession, and then move on with our devotions as if nothing had happened. We also have to remember that a sign of progress in the spiritual life is not to not fall, but to stand up fast after having fallen. He explains that he who falls and stands up immediately hasn't lost much, but he gained experience, so for example, he learned why he fell and how to avoid that next time, and he experienced God's mercy. Father Jacques also explains that God permits us to fall to avoid the greater evil of pride, because if we never fell, we would think that we don't need God to be saved, and we would attribute every good that we do to ourselves. He writes that perfection doesn't consist in never falling, but in loving without interest and in accepting one's faults. And lastly, Father Jacques addresses the time of dryness when we doubt if we love God because we can't feel that love. And here he says that in this moment, we probably love him most and he is closest to us. Now let's get to my opinion on the book. I'd say content-wise, the book is pretty similar to The Heart of Perfection, which I have summarized like two or three weeks ago. And what I found better about this book than about The Heart of Perfection is that I didn't feel accused by the author. Because in The Heart of Perfection, the author said that we all struggle with perfectionism. And in this book, the author described what the problem looks like, what it looks like to not be at peace. He explained why we should change that and how to do that. And I like that much more because I feel like it's a more gentle approach. The book is based on the teachings of St. Therese of Lisieux, which also adds to that gentleness. And I would give it a 9.5, and it's not a 10 out of 10, because since I have read this book, my inner peace hasn't improved. That could be my problem, and so I only subtracted 0 0.5 points. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next week. God bless, and bye!